Hey guys, hey, Dr. Mills here with Mills Chiropractic and Wellness Center. And today I want to talk about one of the most asked questions over the last couple of weeks. What do I think about the coronavirus vaccine? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give the quick answer um, in the first minute or so here um, for those of you that just want the meat and potatoes. And then I'm going to explain things in the second part of the video, which is going to take a little bit of time uh, getting through that. So the quick part of it is uh, I believe for most people, you should probably take the, the vaccine. Um, that's the short summary version of it. When it becomes available to you, for most situations, you should probably take it. Now, if you've had coronavirus already, you can probably take a little bit more of a wait and see attitude because you should have some antibodies. I would suggest getting your antibody levels tested to, to see that you do have those, um, and that you developed good antibodies. And, and then you can, like I said, take a more of a wait and see. And so that is my cut to the chase recommendation for, for most patients. There are certainly caveats um, and different things. You know, if you have uh, allergies and things like that, you know, we, you may want to take a more wait and see approach. Um, again, each person is individual. Each person ha uh, has unique situations as to uh, their risk tolerance ratios um, that they need to weigh. Okay, so now that I got that over in the first one minute, now I'm going to talk to you guys that are saying, what in the world is Dr. Mills off of his crazy rocker? Doesn't he know, um, you know, all these concerns that, that patients are bringing up? And so I kind of want to address those um, and explain how it is that I, that I kind of came to that recommendation. But one of the first things that I think patients often ask me, you know, with the coronavirus vaccine and um, why I sometimes get some eyebrows is a lot of patients know right off of the bat that I am not necessarily a pro-vaccine person, but I'm not necessarily an anti-vaccine. I am a informed decision proponent, right? And so what do I mean by that? I, I believe that we should all have our own individual choice when it comes to vaccination because we're all unique and we're all in different situations. You know, I what I really despise is a lot of the uh, first information, uh, manipulative information that is usually uh, surrounding vaccinations. And I think, you know, as we talk about the coronavirus vaccine, I love that we get to actually have this conversation and you're not labeled as, you know, an idiot if you get it and, or as, you know, an ignorant person if you don't, right? Um, which is typically how these discussions you go. Um, and, and that's been one of the, the nice things and maybe one of the surprising things to me is, you know, a lot of the patients that have asked me my opinion on this, you know, they are the, and, and I tell them, you know, I, hey, I think you should probably get it. They're the ones that are giving me the eyebrow, like, are you sure? Um, but they're the same ones that think that I'm crazy when I say, you know, I think we probably over vaccinate in general and we really need to look at our vaccination schedules and sequence and how much we're giving and all of these things. Um, and, you know, and they, they, they think I'm crazy for that. Right. So it's kind of a no win situation whenever I answer these questions. So I tend to try to avoid it. But it's such an important discussion. I, I wanted to have it. And so how did I get to the point where, you know, I am recommending the COVID virus vaccine. Well, whenever we look at a vaccine, there's a number of things that we need to evaluate. The first one is, you know, what is our risk? What is our risk of, uh, first of all, contracting the condition? And second of all, what's our risk of having, you know, a bad reaction to it? This is oftentimes one of those things that I don't think gets weighed appropriately, right? Um, and so, you know, when it comes to the risk of the coronavirus, um, Nobody has immunity to it right now, so it kind of spreads like wildfire. So there is a high probability that at some point all of us are going to be exposed um, in, in a situation where the coronavirus can, can take a foothold. And so whereas many things, I, I think our exposure ratio is relatively low, um, polio, for instance, in the United States. Is there polio that still exists in the world? Absolutely. There has not been a wild case of polio in the United States since the 1980s. So our risk of exposure to polio, very, very small. However, our risk to coronavirus, very, very high. Okay. So we got to take that into effect. So the first criteria that we would look at risk of exposure, very high. Second risk um, or ratio that we need to look at is, well, what's um, the risk of an adverse event? Should I catch the condition, right? So for instance, the, the common cold is something that's, that's pretty prevalent um, every year during the winter. You know, most people get a sniffle of some kind of runny nose at some point most winters. We're all, we all have this high exposure rate, but the common cold doesn't really cause any real problems for most people, right? And so even if the, the exposure rate's really high, the risk of adverse events very low, therefore, you know, 
aggressive treatments like vaccinations and things like that, um, probably doesn't meet the criteria of exposing ourselves to a vaccine. Now that gets us to the vaccine, right? So we always have to weigh the risk of the vaccine. And contrary to what's usually told in the media, there is absolutely no such thing as a safe vaccine. We could always have an adverse reaction to any vaccine. Um, and I do appreciate that, uh, especially during this new coronavirus vaccine, that we're actually having this debate and people are actually being forthcoming enough to be able to say, hey, you know, there's some things we don't know. There's some potential here. Um, and, and that's really what they should be saying for all vaccines. But that's never what we get told. We, you know, we always get told, hey, it's safe and it's effective. And if you catch this, you're going to die. Right. It's this fear factor that's usually pushed down our throat. Um, and, and you would, you know, obviously be an idiot not to get the vaccines uh, as soon as they become available because, you know, high exposure rate, death and destruction. And it's perfectly safe to do the vaccine. That's usually the mantra. That's not entirely true. And that's the, the stuff that oftentimes uh, kind of disgusts me when we start having vaccine discussions. Okay, So that's my, my anti versus pro vaccine debate. So let's talk a little bit specifically about the risk with the coronavirus vaccine. So if we know right across the board that no vaccine is perfectly safe, there can be adverse events. What kind of adverse events will we be talking about with the coronavirus or with the uh, coronavirus vaccine. So this is a new vaccine development. Now, again, this has been around since the 19th, the idea. So my background before I went into chiropractic was recombinant DNA research, okay? Um, and we were studying the human genome. The idea was we were going to solve all of humanity's problems once we figured out the human genome. And we, you know, we were going to be, you know, the heroes of the world once we got this figured out. Well, what we quickly started learning um, in the 90s before we got the full human genome project done was there was just not enough information there to explain all of you know, humanity's uh, diseases. And so what we started realizing pretty quickly. So back then, what we thought was 95% of human disease was genetic. The other 5% was environment. Now what we understand is it's probably the inverse. 95% of it is, is environment. Um, and maybe 80 to 90, depending on which. But much more of it is environment than genetic, right? And, and so we... we kind of have spun the pendulum all the way back to the other side. That's actually what uh, uh, drove me to chiropractic because when we were studying this, I realized, no, it's environment. And then and that's what drew me to chiropractic because it was really more of a, a lifestyle uh, type of healthcare where we could talk to patients about diet and exercise and uh, upper neurological processing and all these things that just really drove me towards towards chiropractic because I knew I could have a much bigger impact on on health and disease working on lifestyle than I could working on genetics. Um, so I feel like I have some uh, background in this area that I can kind of dig through the science a little bit. So the way that most vaccines, so when we're talking about the coronavirus vaccine, it's a new vaccine. And I'm going to explain that in a little bit and address some of the fears that patients have with that. Um, so, but typically when we have a vaccine, what's normally given is a protein or a cell fragment or a toxoid of some kind. Basically, it's a foreign substance that's Know, injected into the body in the hope to create a, an immune response. Um, the body sees these foreign proteins, makes antibodies against it, and therefore we neutralize those, those foreign proteins should we see them again. Um, and so, you know, if we see the polio virus, for instance, we've seen pieces of it before, we know how to attack it, we know how to kill it, and we can get rid of it. Um, and that's the, the mechanism by where most of these vaccines, flu virus, for instance, is an attenuated, which means that it's weakened um, virus that our body builds immune system uh, or immune response against. Now, with the COVID vaccine, it's different. What it's doing is it's taking a small fragment of the genetic material found within the coronavirus. So the coronavirus is an RNA-based virus. Uh, encapsulated with, you know, this lipid membrane and these spike proteins that everybody hears about. Um, and it has all this genetic material in it. Um, what the vaccine is doing is it's taking a small fragment of that genetic material and it's injecting it and wrapping it in the lipid membrane, injecting it into the cell. And then the cell is taking that mRNA uh, strand, single-stranded mRNA, and it's make, it attaches to a ribosome and it makes the protein. Um, and that's how, and then as that protein is released from the cell, gets out into the body, body sees that foreign protein just like it would with a normal uh, vaccine, and it sees it and attacks it and gets rid of it. Now, I think what's 
kind of cool from an mRNA vaccine standpoint is that it's um, more pure, if you will. It's a pure protein that's being released into the immune system or into the into the body for the immune system to, to be able to see. A lot of vaccines actually have a lot of other junk, a lot of other proteins that we don't necessarily need, a lot of extra preservatives that we don't actually need um, in order to stabilize the protein structure and 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 if it's an attenuated virus, it's a full viral genetic material that's being injected into the body. And, and so there's a lot of problems with that. And that's why I think we really do need to have some discussion on some of these other vaccines that we're doing. Um, but in, I'm going to kind of, like I said, kind of focus on the, the coronavirus. So one of the concerns that a lot of patients have is, is this vaccine going to alter my DNA? Well, the simple answer is most likely no. <laughs> um, and, and so, and I, I would say definitively no, but there's always something out there, right? But I am 99.9999999% sure that it will not, okay? That's about as sure as I could possibly be. So the reason for this is the way that genetic material typically flows, it's called the central dogma of genetics. Um, and it's a dogma, and it's you know, there's some flaws that are going to show up, right? But basically, DNA is transcribed into um, RNA, and then it's inside of the cytoplasm, and then it's shortened up into this messenger RNA, and then it's released out into the cell, and it binds to the ribosome, makes the protein, and then it's destroyed. Um, and so with the mRNA virus or vaccine, what it does is it starts with mRNA, which gets into the into the cell with this membrane particle that they developed, which has been developed, you know, been working on for a long time because nobody could figure out how to get these signals into the cell. We've known mRNA has this potential for a really long time. We just haven't ever been able really to figure out how to get it into the cell. But anyway, it takes that mRNA and makes the protein um, that way. Now, people are asking me, can it modify our genetic material? Well, the short answer to this is I would say 99.99999 that it cannot, because it's a small snippet of, of genetic material. And in order for RNA, RNA really cannot get into the nucleus, okay? It can leave the nucleus, but it, it really can't get in unless it has very specific uh, signals um, on it to, that allows it to get in there. The two viruses that we know that can get into the genetic material are the HIV virus and the human papillomavirus. Those two viruses do have the ability to alter our DNA. Um, but a messenger RNA really, really can't do that. Um, they also have very specific enzymes that allow them to replicate the RNA that they're made of into DNA, and then they also have other enzymes that allow them to insert into the DNA, and they are very complicated processes. In fact, it wasn't until the last couple of years that we actually finally figured out how uh, the HIV virus actually gets into the nucleus because, you know, it's such a big virus to begin with. There's the, the holes to get into the nucleus aren't that big, but they finally figured out the uncoupling mechanism a couple of years ago, which, you know, may lead to new age treatments down the road. But you guys, we're talking about the coronavirus. I got off track. Sorry, squirrel. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, with the messenger RNA, it doesn't have the enzymes to be able to get into there. Um, and even if it did, it would need to be inside of a cell that has AIDS or a uh, human papillomavirus for it to even replicate the the strand anyway. On top of that, it's not a double-stranded RNA, it's a single-stranded, so it couldn't match up. It would it would basically, even if it could get into the DNA, which it cannot, but even if it could, it wouldn't have its mating partner because it's not a double strand. What it would do is cause the DNA to fold up over itself. It would basically kill the cell, but it wouldn't be allowed to replicate um, because the DNA material would be, would be destroyed. Now, on the flip side, you know, when we talk about, I know that it's always scary when we talk genetic material because it's not most people's background, right? Um, and so it is sort of genetic material, but it's not really, is, is kind of what I would say. The other flip side to that argument of, you know, can it alter our DNA is that if you do catch the coronavirus, you're being exposed to thousands of more um, uh, nuclear material. You're being exposed to thousands more uh, bases of new, uh, RNA which is more easily transcribed with reverse transcriptase if you happen to have the, that particular enzyme because of AIDS or human papilloma. We do not naturally have that enzyme. We couldn't even, if we wanted to, we couldn't make uh, DNA from RNA. But those two viruses can. And so theoretically, if you got it into the cell, 
theoretically you could convert RNA back into DNA, but it still doesn't even have the right enzymes to insert it. So again, it's it's kind of a no no go situation. I'm just trying to explain the science of it. The but anyway, if you did catch the virus, understand that that is vastly more de, uh, genetic material than the uh, vaccine that's currently being used. Um, the other uh, kind of concern, and I think this is a, a good concern, and this is why I would say some patients probably need to hold back and wait and kind of take a wait and see, is is this going to result in more autoimmune conditions? I personally do not think that it will, um, but I can see a mechanism whereby it could. Okay, and so this is would be my one hesitancy towards the vaccine. Now I would say um, it's a it's an unknown vaccine, so we just don't know. And that's what I'm kind of interested to look look at in the future: is are there more autoimmune uh, situations to develop because of this mechanism of delivery? Now, with an autoimmune condition, it oftentimes takes years um, to fully manifest. So again, the older you are, you, your immune system is not as Bust anyway, so the chances of getting an autoimmune condition are pretty low. But the younger you get, your immune system is better. Your chance theoretically would raise. Um, but personally, to be honest, I don't think that we're probably going to result in a whole lot more autoimmune conditions than we do with any other vaccine that we've deemed to be safe, right? Um, and so I have some concern, the risk of the unknown, right? That's a risk that we have to weigh. I have some concern but I really don't have any more than I would have with any other vaccine that we, that we utilize. Um, and so I hope that answers some of your questions. I realize this is much longer than what many of you um, have, in, you know, that we're used to sending out. I do think that it does raise a lot of really good questions, and I'm glad that we actually get to have a discussion on this particular vaccine, um, whereas most of the time we don't get to have those. They're force-fed, they're mandatory, they're all of these things that I that I really wish we would, you know, maybe have, take a step back and, and evaluate whether we're given the right ones at the right time, at the right age, you know, all of those things. And those are discussions for a whole different webinar that would take hours as we break down each one. Um, but I, I hope that maybe this pandemic is, and as we come up with a vaccine, um, that maybe we can have these discussions in the future and not necessarily be labeled as, you know, pro-vaccine everything, pro-medicine everything, or, you know, an ignorant anti-vaxxer, right? And there's there's some gray area that, that I think we can all eventually find our way to. Um, and, and science... Um, and understanding can uh, lead the way. Um, and I'm, I'm hopeful that, that maybe this is one of those steps that, that maybe we can take a tragedy and, and reevaluate some of the other things that we're currently doing. So anyway, hope you got something from it. Stay healthy, stay well. Until next time.